Okay, we're going into Christian growth now. We're born again, but we're not just supposed to stay stagnant and be babies. We've got to grow up. Okay? God said, be fruitful and multiply. Well, in order for you to be fruitful and multiply, you've got to mature into a, a spiritual adult. Oh, excuse me. So we're going to look at change versus conflict. Change often comes to us in the disguise of conflict. We see conflict, but what it really is is an opportunity to change. Okay? We really would do well if we could get to the place where we could trust God so that when bad things happen in our lives, conflict happens, we just go, okay, this is going to be an adventure. I wonder what God's about to do with my life. And not be mad at Him or, you know, take the attitude that God's failing me or He's not meeting my expectation or, you know, Joel Osteen, this is not what He told me was going to happen. All right? Okay. <laughs> We need to embrace conflict as a, as a uh, vehicle for change. Christian growth is a transformational process of being conformed to the image of Christ. Christ as the big brother. The perfect big, big brother that your parents say, you should follow the example of your brother. That's who Jesus is and that's what our, all these things, God is working all things together for the good of those who love him. Okay? He's working all these things together for the good of those who love Him. And are the call according to His purpose for God, those God for whom He did also predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ, that Christ might be the firstborn among many brothers. Okay? So all the conflict, all these things, God is working together for the good, for the change. Okay? Servitude. You will be changed as you give yourself to service. Listen, until you say, I'm going to do something, you have not put yourself in a position to be pushed around. And you haven't been put, you know, in a position to be pushed around. Change, well, being pushed around changes people. Think of Joseph in the Bible. He got pushed around a lot, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He was changed. He was, he was made ready for the dream that God had given him. Okay? The dream is just the destination, but there's a journey between the time you have the dream and the time you realize the dream. Transparency. Growth has to be, you have to be transparent. Okay? If we're afraid to be exposed by what conflict does in our lives, if we're afraid of what it might expose, we're going to hide. And it's not going to be able to do its work. Do you understand what I'm saying? Submission to authorities. Oh boy. This is where you have to say, okay. Look, my dad used to say, listen, Paul, I don't care that Chad's parents let him do that or Greg's parents let him do that. I'm your parent. God gave you to me. Therefore, what I think is right, okay, is ultimately going to be the, the issue here. It's the same thing with this church. You could have had, you know... Some other great pastor is your pastor. But this is the pastor God has given you. You know, you're a youth leader. This is the youth leader. This is the worship leader. This is the board. These are the people that God has You have to submit to those people, not because, oh, they're so great, but rather that they have been, they have had the authority of God bestowed on them. And to submit to them is ultimately to submit to God. And when it, in the issue of children submitting to their parents, why? That it may go well with you. Not because your parents are always going to do what's right, but God says that if you will submit to the authority that I lay down, I will take it as you're submitting to me and I will give you a blessing. Okay? Relinquishment of rights. Okay? Now this is, you've probably heard the scripture that I will come all things to all men so that by all means I might win some. So I'm going to get myself tattoos so I can win, you know, the the skinheads, I'm going to go out and get, you know, whatever, okay? I'm going to smoke cigarettes so I can, you know, win people to the Lord. I'm going to go, whatever. These crazy ideas. Uh, grow my hair long. I don't know. Just all those things, reasons that people give for why they do what they do, okay? That is not what that scripture meant at all. What it meant was, I'll give up any right so that I might not offend someone so that they can come to Christ. Okay? For instance, 
If we have a guy who comes into the church and he's Muslim, okay, eating pork is a no good thing for him. Okay, they don't eat pork. Mm -hmm. All right. So if I'm around that guy, or if we're having dinners, mm -hmm. guess what? I don't want to do eat pork. I don't want to eat pork. Now, is it sin for me to eat pork? No. But the issue is, I want to see this person come to Christ, and I want anything to stand in the way of him being able to hear life from me. He sees me sucking on a on a on a pork rib. He's going to be like, you know, I can't I can't listen to what this guy said. I can't trust him. So there's a lot of things that we don't do because people won't understand. Okay, they'll, they'll become drinking wine is a, one of the reasons that we do not drink wine is because for many people, you know, they believe it's sin. They believe it's sin. Our denomination believes it's sin. Okay. So, I don't drink wine because of people's sensitivities. I'll become all things to all men so that I, I might win some. I will relinquish my rights. And what did Jesus do here in Philippians chapter 2? Though being in the very nature God, okay, He gave that up, set that aside, and made Himself nothing. Why? So that He could save us. Alright? Paul says the same thing in these passages. Alright, next one, brokenness. We're going to be broken. Brokenness is a good thing. When we're broken, God puts us back together. In our weakness, He is strong. Unilateral forgiveness. Oh, this is the really hard one, guys. We are going to be challenged to forgive people who don't even say they're sorry. I remember that one right there. I remember 23, 34. I don't remember the exact words, but I remember using that in 10th grade to... Because I was, like, something happened between me and my friend Philip, and I remember that verse, and I, I, next day I apologized for something I didn't even do. Mm -hmm. And we let my Bible be out of us and let it go. Mm -hmm. And look where we are now. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're going to have to be willing to forgive people. Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. Okay, and the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of the times that people do something wrong to you, they had no intentions of doing it. Okay? You were just the collateral damage. They wanted to, they basically, most of the time, people who hurt you are just wanting to please themselves. And in the process, they ran over you. Okay? Okay, church ordinances. We, as we grow, as we change, as we, you know, uh, become, uh, grow, one of the things that we, we, we are told to do is to be water baptized. Okay? Why do we do this? Well, it's following Christ's example. Jesus himself did it. He said, I'm doing this to fulfill all righteousness. If he needed to do it, <clears throat> Alright. Identification with Christ in his <laughs> death, burial, and resurrection. Go to Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> this is what Paul says it symbolizes. You get down to the water, is it symbol of, of death and burial. And then we're raised to life. That that you know that same picture we saw earlier where that that wall of, of, of being dead to God is taken away. Now we're alive to God. We're resurrected. Initiation into the covenant people of God into the body of Christ in the church. Now this is something that most Assembly of God churches don't teach, but I teach. Okay? Because I believe that water baptism in the New Testament is like circumcision in the Old Testament. You could be born of Abraham, but you were not considered a, a, a the people of Abraham under the covenant that God promised Abraham unless you were circumcised. You don't do circumcision, right? No, we don't oh. do circumcision. <laughs> <laughs> Your son told me that before. He said, are you circumcised? I'm like, what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, then. All right. Um, but... For us, water baptism is that. We can be born again, okay? And we're born again before we're water baptized. But when we're water baptized, we are saying, I am now part of the organic covenant people, organizational covenant people, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm now, and we can recognize you as that, where until you're baptized, I don't recognize people as born again until they get baptized, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I assume that, I mean, I recognize them as born again. But if they refuse to be baptized, my, my um, stating that they're born again is going to be on hold. You know?
know, my testifying that this person's a Christian is going to be on hold until they're water baptized. Um, it's an act of obedience. We do it by immersion instead of sprinkling and pouring like other some other churches do. Uh, that goes immersion goes more with the picture that Paul play, plays there of the death and burial. You know, we're trinitarian. We we we, we do it uh, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit versus oneness. Now, I recently had a, a situation where I came across some oneness Pentecostals. They believe you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus or you're not saved. Okay? It doesn't count. Okay? And the reason they do that is because all through the book of Acts, it never says one time that they were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It says they were baptized in the name of Jesus. Now, the reason it says that is because if you look like in a chapter 19 of Acts, there was also John's baptism. And so Paul says to them, well, what baptism did you receive? Well, John's baptism. And he says, well, John baptized uh, under repentance, but he told it them to think about the one who's coming after, okay? And on hearing that, those guys were all then baptized in the name of Jesus. Okay, not, I baptize you in the name of Jesus, but rather they were baptized into Christ as opposed into being a disciple of Christ. Because that's what baptism says. This is who we belong to. This is, this is who we are part of. Okay, any questions about that? Alright. The other ordinance is the Lord's Supper. Um, I put a little thing on here to, to help us understand um, maybe what the views of the Lord's Supper is, but I'm just going to, for sake of time, we are of the Baptist view. We believe that there is nothing happening when we take communion, just by virtue of the fact that we're taking communion. Okay, it is a wafer, it is grape juice, and nothing happens without us really interacting with God. The, the grape juice and the, and the wafer do nothing. It's simply a reminder of our salvation. There's no grace imparted to us by doing it. We we do it. In, out of obedience to Christ to remember what He's done for us. Okay? Remember where we came from. The Reformed view, like the Presbyterians, they believe that the elements are unchanged, but Christ is present in a special way during communion. Okay? Lutherans believe that the, 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 the elements are the body and blood of Christ, but they don't change in the body of, of, and blood of Christ. But they, they are literally the body and, and blood of Christ, but they don't actually change into the body of blood. Where Catholics believe when the priest when the priest blesses it, it actually turns into the literal body and blood of Jesus because Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. And they believe that literally. Okay? Um, and that's not what we believe. We believe Jesus was speaking figuratively. For instance, when Jesus broke the bread and handed it around the table, did he pull anything off of his own body? No. Mm -hmm. Uh, no. Okay, so obviously it was symbolic. Okay? <laughs> it was symbolic. Alright? But unfortunately, Catholics think otherwise. I never read the Bible. That's called transubstantiation because it's transformed. Its substance is transformed. Consubstantiation is with substance. It has the substance, it's just transformed. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean that we can't have a spiritual experience when we're having communion. And we should. Okay? But it's not innate. It's something we have to foster. Okay? Ordinance is the non-ordained ordinance. It's marriage. Jesus, God took an oath uh, to, to marry um, to marry Jerusalem. And we know the Bible tells us it's better for a man to marry than burn with passion. We do baby dedications, kind of recognizing that our children are not really ours. We're stewards of them. Okay? And we basically are coming to say, I'm going to be a faithful steward to raise this child in, in, in the ways of God. Okay? I do baby blessings for people who I can't abide, qualify for baby dedication. Because if you're not going to follow God yourself, you're not going to raise your kid in God. So I'll bless their baby, you know, sometimes without them even asking like I've done in church, maybe you've seen, okay? But I'm not going to dedicate that child <coughs> unless the parents are dedicated. I'm going to buy a third coffin all of a sudden again. All right, burial. Um, burial is a biblical idea. Uh, um, Abraham was buried. Uh, Lazarus was buried. Um, 
eulogizing David, eulogized Saul. If you read the first chapter of 2 Samuel, he, he talked about who Saul was. Um, so we, that's what we do. Now, we don't believe that you have to be buried. We don't, we don't have anything against cremation. There's really nothing in Scripture that speaks to that that I'm aware of, and I'm pretty aware of what's in Scripture, but um, I, I know of no place that, that says that it's not right to do that, okay? That it's somehow sinful. I know in the Lord of the Rings they talk about how the heathen do this, and it is true that, that like the pagans, they, they, they burn people. But that in itself doesn't make it evil, okay? They also go to the bathroom just like us, but that doesn't make it evil. <laughs> foot washing some of our other uh, brothers and sisters in Christ be believe that foot washing is another ordinance we don't believe that and the reason that they believe that is because the night Jesus was betrayed he washed their feet and he used these words he says now that I have done these things unto you you'll be blessed if you do them okay um, and so they think that, that foot washing is something that we should do as an ordinance. Okay? I don't know too many people have their foot wash out of people's feet. Well, that's the whole idea, though. It's is, is, is a symbol of doing the dirty work, being the servant of a person. Jesus did this to Peter, and Peter's like, Lord, what are you doing? I should be washing your feet, or, or you, know, you know, there's no way you're going to wash them. Jesus says, unless I wash your feet. You have no part of me. In other words, if you don't let me serve you, you're lost. Okay? And that's essentially where we are. Now we get to the big fun subject. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. The reason the Assembly of God exists is because of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We, we could be part of uh, many other denominations if we didn't believe what we believe about this thing. Okay, so in the Old Testament, we read that prophets, priests, and kings were anointed with the Holy Spirit. And someone will say that only prophets, priests, and kings were not. I'm not sure I would go that far. It's all, that's all we see. It says we're anointed, but I don't know how any other how any other God-fearing person in those days and ages could have done what God wanted them to do as just a human being, just not a priest or a prophet or a king, just a regular everyday worshiper of God. If they didn't have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. I, just, I tend to think that they just told us about the prophet, priest, and king, and that everybody could get the same experience if they saw it. Right? Well, see, when I read that, it just makes me think of Joseph and Ruth, or not Ruth, but <clears throat> Esther. Because if you think about it, they were both, well, Esther is more poor. I think Joseph may have been too, but they didn't get to be a king until after they were already in that place of, of power. That's my thinking of it. Okay. In the New Testament, we, 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 what, we, what we often talk about is how this was kind of, this anointing was, <clears throat> and th these guys were actually physically anointed, by the way. They had oil poured over their head. Okay. But in, in that symbolized the Holy Spirit coming upon them in an empowering way. Okay. Um, in the New Testament, we don't actually pour oil over people's head, but we believe everybody is now uh, able to receive the same empowerment that the kings, the priests, and the, and the prophets had in the Old Testament. Okay? Matter of fact, the Bible says God's made us a kingdom of priests. Okay? So, this is the subject of the very last words of Jesus Christ. His last words were not what we read in the Great Commission. Those were actually given on a mountain in Galilee, okay, during the 40 days that he was on the earth after he had risen from the dead. But these words are spoken on, these are his very last words, wait for the promise of the Father. You're going to receive the baptism of the Spirit not many days from now. This is Jesus' last words, and last words we should pay attention to, okay? Secondly, we find five occurrences of, the, of, of this thing in the book of Acts. Hello. Five occurrences of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, they're baptized in the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 8, at, at Samaria, the Samaritans are baptized in the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 9, Paul is told he will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Okay, we know later he speaks in other tongues. Acts chapter 10, Cornelius' house, the Jews are there, completely out of place. 
weren't even supposed to be there according to Jewish tradition. Okay? And yet God baptized these uncircumcised Gentiles in the Holy Spirit. They were totally blown away. And it, the only thing they conclude is now God is no longer requiring you to be a Jew in order to be a part of the church. And then in Acts chapter 19, uh, after these disciples of John are baptized in water into Jesus, Paul lays his hands on them and they receive the Holy Spirit there. Now, this is called the promise of the Father and it's called an endowment with power. Okay? Um, when, oh, I'm sorry. These actually are the synonymous terms. All these things mean, mean the same thing. All of these refer to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's called the promise of the Father. You'll be endued with power, Jesus says. In Acts chapter 1, verse 5 and 8, it's, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit, receive power, and the Holy Ghost will come upon you. All those words are used there to describe the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, 4 and th uh, 33, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. It's again called, called the promise of the Father, and the Holy Spirit is poured out. In Acts chapter 8, it's called receiving the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit being given. Um, in Acts chapter 10, the Holy Spirit fell on them, the Holy Spirit was poured out, or they received the Holy Spirit again. And in Acts chapter 19, they received the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. All these <laughs> are synonymous ways of, <coughs> of referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. Now, it's accompanied by the sign of tongues. In the day of Pentecost, very plainly, they all spoke in other tongues. In Cornelius' house, they knew that they were accepted now because they heard them speak in other tongues. Uh, Ephesians chapter 19, they spoke in other tongues. That, those three occurrences satisfy the biblical precedence for the reliability of testimony. If you were to look up all these verses, basically what it says is, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. God, you see something once in the Bible, you know, it has authority. But when that thing is repeated two and three times, you better pay attention, okay? Because God says, let everything be done. If we were to, if we were to get into a situation of discipline with somebody, okay? If, if, I, if Luke comes to me and says, Pastor, you know, you, you, uh, you really were mean to Ashley. You were wrong. Okay? And I'm like, I don't know if I'm wrong. She really annoyed me. She took me out, blah, 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 blah. Okay? Then somebody else who was there with Luke comes with me and says, hey, you were wrong. Now I better take it. I better take it more seriously because now I have two witnesses coming at me. If I get a third, oh boy. Now if I refuse to listen to Luke and another person, then you're told to go to the church and bring it in front of everyone who saw that in order to get me to recognize that. So in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. You're not allowed to entertain an accusation against a leader in your church except on the mouth, on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Not one witness who told another one, and now this one's hearsay along with the one who saw it happen. We're talking about independent witnesses. Okay? And so here we have the, the principle of three in the book of Acts, three times we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, Three times they speak in other tongues. No other sign, the wind, prophesying, or being filled with joy is ever repeated. Only tongues is ever repeated, and it's repeated three times. Now, it's applied on other occasions. In Acts chapter 8, 18 through 19, it's not mentioned there. But this is actually the, the scripture that tells us that there should be a... Um, a an initial evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Because they come and they say, look, the Samaritans have not received the Holy Spirit. How did they know they didn't receive the Holy Spirit? And then whenever uh, Paul, Peter, and John lay their hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. How did they know? Well, apparently this carnal sorcerer was able to figure it out. So there was some physical manifestation that they had been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Some physical thing took place. Some physical evidence initial, as soon as they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, it happened. So I would call it the initial physical evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit, tongues. Now, it's not, it's not, in Acts chapter 8, tongues isn't mentioned. And nothing's mentioned. But we can glean from these other places, that's what happened. Alright, in Acts chapter 9, uh, Ananias comes to Paul and says, I have been sent from God 
to lay hands on you that you receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, the Bible tells us that Ananias lays his hands on him, and guess what happens to his eyes? He can see. It doesn't mention that he gets baptized in the Holy Spirit. Okay? But he gets up and he's baptized. All right? And usually baptism, the baptism in the Holy Spirit occurs after you're baptized in water. Okay? Once you're a part of the people of God, then you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. The only reason it's different at Cornelius' house, where the Gentiles were, these uncircumcised people, was because they, the uncircumcised people were not admitted to the church. You had to become a circumcised Jew and become a, a disciple of Moses in order to be allowed to be a part of the church. So if I, have, as a Gentile, wanted to be a part of the church, I had to undergo circumcision and become a, 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 a disciple of Moses, then I could enter the church. Acts chapter 10 blew that whole thing out of the water. And the only reason that speaking in other tongues preceded baptism there is they didn't know that those people could be admitted into the church. They didn't know they could baptize them. But once they, they, they spoke in other tongues, ugh, they're saved. We got to baptize them. All right? So you follow all that? Okay. We know that in 1 Corinthians 14, 18, Paul says, I speak in tongues more than you all. So Paul definitely spoke in tongues. Going on, it's an experience separate from or subsequent to being born again. This is not being born again. This is not being water baptized. When I bring you in to the, to, the, to the interview, and I ask you to explain what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is, please do not tell me it's water baptism. Okay? Please do not tell me it's being born again. It is not those things. You are born again, then you're water baptized, then you seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's the, that's the way it happens. There are occasions where people are born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit at the same time, supposedly. I, I haven't seen any of that with my own eyes. There are some people, I'm sure, that you know when they get water baptized. Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit when he was water baptized. Okay, he come up out of the water and the Holy Spirit descended upon him. He was anointed. Acts chapter 10, verse 38 says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, that's a human, right? Speaking of him in his human terms. With the Holy Ghost and power... The Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, was anointed with the Holy Ghost and power. And went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the enemy. Why? Because God was with them. What? He was God. No, he only did what he did here on earth as a human empowered by the Holy Spirit. Not ever informing his deity. Not once. Okay? All right. Every miracle he did by the power of the Holy Spirit, not by his divinity. This was the whole thing Satan tried to get him to do whenever he was in the wilderness, was to make use of his dinner. You're the son of God? I just heard him say, you're the son of God. But this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Okay? From there, he goes out in the desert. The devil's like, you think you're the son of God? Well, let's prove it. Turn these stones into bread. He was trying to get him to, to use his divine power for himself. When did he do that? Last time. What was the last time he did that? When Jesus was on the cross? Or when... When Jesus was in the garden, he could call 10 legions or 12 legions of angels to save them. He could call on his divinity, but he didn't. Okay? All right. It's for everyone, and it's for today. The scripture says there, it's for as all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So it is for everyone. Everyone, every Christian in the world is to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. If you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, you should be seeking the baptism in the Holy Spirit. If you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you better be using it, praying in tongues, and seeking God to guide you. Okay, essential Christian disciplines, the Bible. If you're going to think like God, you need to, to expose yourself to the thinking of God. John chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus says, To the Jews who believed in Him, so he wasn't satisfied with them just believing. He said, if you continue in my word, you keep yourself attached, mind the branches. Mm -hmm. If you continue in my word, you're really my disciple. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. There is no transformation apart from the truth of God. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, brother, by the mercy of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, this is your reasonable act of service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your noggin. 
right? Renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So it is essential that you are in the Scriptures, okay? To say, I read the Bible, that's not how it works. We read the Bible. We are in the Scripture. We are people of the book. Jesus memorized this book. He quoted from the book. He said, have you never read? It is written. Jesus was constantly, he made use of it all the time. Okay? Prayer. Prayer is more than asking requests. If you look at how Jesus taught us to pray, he was, prayer is seeking the kingdom of God first. That's essentially what prayer is. When Jesus teaches us to pray, our Father, our relationship with God, okay? That's the first thing we're to think of when we're talking about praying, is we are recognizing the whole point of this is relationship with God. Hallowed be your name. So his name is the thing I'm first to be concerned about. His reputation. And me, as his son, bringing good reputation upon him, right? Your kingdom come. His rule is the next thing. His rule in my life, his rule in the world, his rule in the church, his rule in my brothers and sisters in Christ. And your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what's the first thing that prayer is about? It's about me getting connected to the will of God. His kingdom his, 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 his will, His name. I live for those things. Then I pray for my stuff. Give me today my daily bread. Forgive me my trespasses. Lead me not to temptation. Deliver me from evil. Okay? Fellowship. Okay? We are part of a body. I cannot survive as the ear apart from the body. You can't take the ear off, put it on the table, and it do any good. Okay? It's going to dry up, and it's not going to even realize its purpose. I need you to realize my purpose. You need me to realize your purpose. Okay? We must be in fellowship with one another in order for the, the, the Spirit of God to move through us and minister to one another. Okay? And witness. Alright? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. What was the whole reason they were baptized in the Holy Spirit? You will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be witnesses unto me. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other parts of the Follow all that? Okay. 